After two nights of violent protests, North Carolina's governor declared a state of emergency and imposed a curfew following the fatal shooting in Charlotte. But the impacts of the events in Charlotte seem to be spreading across the country. Newswatch will give you a look at how Oxford is responding to recent events. Good evening and thank you for tuning in to Newswatch. I'm Abby Cummings. Here on the Ole Miss campus, we had our own protest last week. It was one comment after another that led to issues among students and faculty. Newswatch reporter Daniela Oropesa has more on this story. Thanks, Abby. Last Friday, a protest was held in the Lyceum after students became unhappy with the way Ole Miss administration handled a situation involving a student's racist comment and another student's Facebook post involving the recent protests in Charlotte. Jordan Sampson commented on ASB Senator Andrew Soper's Facebook post and said, I have a tree with enough room for all of them if you want to settle this Wild West style. Ole Miss officials responded to the situation via Twitter and said, We do not support this type of language that encourages and condones violence. We will investigate. Following the protest, which drew several students and media of all types, Ole Miss deleted their tweet. However, Chancellor Vitter tweeted, Thankful for conversation with thoughtful students who challenge us, help us better understand difficult topics. Followed by a link to his statement, which read in light of our country's history, that comment can only be seen as racist, offensive, and hurtful, especially to members of our African American community. There is no place in our community for racist or violent acts. Many sources have said that Andrew Soper made a statement that the Mississippi flag should not fly if it creates division. However, in a statement of clarification on Facebook, Soper stated, I believe it is important to establish dialogue so that we as a community may better understand each other's viewpoints and work together towards a more politically inclusive environment on campus. That being said, I continue to stand behind my belief that the state flag should be displayed on campus and I hope to continue with my efforts to make the views of myself and other members of the Mississippi community heard. As this story develops, tune in and keep up with us on Twitter at Newswatch underscore UM. Back to you, Abby. The city of Charlotte is dealing with a protest of their own. Lauren Layton has more on the violent events happening in the city. Yeah, Abby, Charlotte has been the site of these violent protests for nearly a week now, but the way his death was handled has impacted more than just those in the city. The man in this video is the reason for the latest spotlight on the growing tensions between law enforcement and the black community. Keith Lamont Scott was killed by an officer last Tuesday in Charlotte, and the city has been in a state of emergency ever since. The conflict has stretched far beyond North Carolina as people even in Oxford have felt the impact. It's always really, really infuriating just to see how easily that a black person is killed by the, by the police. And then it gets really, really sad because you realize again that this could be you, this could be your friends, this could be anyone that you know. It's still unclear exactly why Scott was shot, but police say a lot of the time it's impossible to know unless you're the one faced with the issue. You, you, you have to live it. So... Law enforcement lives in a world where action is faster than reaction. The only way you can even get an idea what it's like is just be in that position and walk up there. It's, it can be, it be kind of hair-raising at times. Both agree that change has to come soon, but the process of reaching it is unclear. I believe that rioting is a language of the, peop of the oppressed people. I believe it is one form of change, and I believe that sometimes it's actually very, very important because if you look throughout history, there are no, there are very few successful nonviolent uh, protests. Marching is always good. Protesting, there's nothing wrong with it. Everybody needs to express that. Rioting will never get it. In fact, I think it, it has a reverse effect on things. This incident is an example of one of the many violent protests that have been happening all over the nation in an effort to bring change. If you have been paying attention to any of this, then you would know that they've been speaking and just no one has been listening. And now they have to speak in a different type of way. Opinions will always differ, but the pain for those involved is felt by all. The hatred and the criticism that is coming out there, that's coming off this, I mean, it's heartbreaking to know that that these officers that I represent are willing to go out here at any given time and, and you know, potentially die for you. The reason that Scott was shot is still under investigation. We're going to keep you updated on that on our Twitter. Back to you. The 12th ranked Georgia Bulldogs rolled into Oxford this past weekend. We have Colin Rivera here in the studio to break down this past weekend's matchup. Colin. Thanks, Abby. It was a huge weekend for the Ole Miss Rebels as they looked to bounce back from the big loss against Alabama. Could they do it against number 12 Georgia at Vaught Hemingway Stadium? Let's show the highlights. 
Ole Miss came guns blazing against Georgia as Derek Jones picks off Jacob Eason, follows his blockers, and he goes to the house to start off early against Ole Miss. They would continue on the offensive side as Penniman would run it in and Chad Kelly would shake off a defender and would heave it deep into the end zone and Demarcus Lodge would take care of the rest as he would score. Later on in the game, Chad Kelly would continue the success and would heave it up deep and jump man, jump man, jump man Ingram is up to something and he scores it and the offense just continues as Georgia's defense was really just irrelevant for the whole entire game as Chad Kelly would run it deep off a of fake and he would take it to the house for a 41 yard touchdown and the icing on the cake would be an Easton fumble here as Ole Miss would win big 45 to 14. Rebels win big over Georgia and here's what Freeze had to say, even Ingram had to say on the big win over Georgia. I feel great today, don't you? I mean, we just beat a top 15 team pretty bad, pretty soundly. Uh, I was, uh, I'm pleased. It builds up a lot of confidence. That's one thing that uh, is, is huge about today is we were able to we were able to bounce back and respond to some adversity we saw. So we're gonna take we're gonna take each game step by step, and we're gonna play our football and we're, and we're gonna see where it uh, lands us. We'll have more sports for you later on in the show. Back to you at the desk, Abby. It's a child's dream come true. No homework. A growing amount of elementary schools around the country are doing away with homework. This is to allow kids more time to socialize, read, and sleep. The Associated Press has more. How many of us remember that from yesterday? The students in Ms. Mitchell's fourth grade class are eager to ask questions. But when it comes to homework, the enthusiasm turns into something else. I get stressed out. It was so stressful. But I feel like I'm getting rushed around the house and I don't have any time to play outside. While those complaints aren't new, a growing number of elementary schools and individual teachers across the country have decided to do something about it. Principal Christy Hyatt implemented a no homework policy in her Alabama elementary school this fall determined through the articles that I had read that there was no benefit academically for homework for elementary school students. In his book, The Homework Myth, Alfie Cohn, a leading voice in education, found no correlation between after-school work and academic success. More educators are finally realizing that homework is all pain and no gain for children, and perhaps they're being helped in that realization by parents. And so I found that our students are coming to school a little less stressed and um, a little less exhausted. Giving families more control over their time was part of the reason Oak Ridge Elementary School in Virginia did away with homework this year. What our children really needed was time reading, time with family, time outside, having opportunities for other sorts of learning outside of school. The move welcomed by parents struggling to keep up with multiple after school activities. I am so grateful to not have that round of battles again in elementary school. But other schools say they have no plans to ditch homework. Duke University researcher Harris Cooper says all kids should be doing homework, but how much depends on their age. Homework has benefits for kids that go beyond academic achievement by giving kids an opportunity to begin developing study habits, even in the second grade, and time management skills. But at the end of the day, you won't hear these kids complaining when the bell rings, and they don't have to think about school till tomorrow. Marina Hutchinson, The Associated Press. Early this morning, a shooting at a mall shook up a neighborhood in Houston. Newswatch will have more on this story next, but first, Christine Williamson has your first look at weather. this morning as a disgruntled lawyer opened fire at a shopping center in southwest Houston, Texas. The shooter was identified as Nathan Desai who had previously worked at McDaniel and Desai LLP before the practice was closed down sometime last year due to a lack of clients. 
Three victims were treated on the scene, and then three of the six victims who were transferred to area hospitals for treatment have been released, but one is left in critical condition. The FBI is offering assistance to Houston police in their ongoing investigation of the incident, but the Houston police remains the lead agency at this time. The suspect in the deadly shooting at a Washington State mall last Friday is now in custody after being spotted from a patrol car over the weekend in Oak Harbor, Washington. 20-year-old Arkan Sutton was reported as unarmed and carrying a satchel with a computer in it at the time of his arrest. Police say he was zombie-like on Saturday night when they approached him. This arrest was the conclusion of the manhunt following the slayings of five people the day before. Sutton has not been charged but will be booked into Skagit County Jail and is expected to appear in court today. Confrontation ensues between Congress and President Obama after he vetoed a unanimously backed piece of legislation on Friday. Congress vowed to uphold this legislation that would allow victims of the terrorist attacks on September 11th to sue the Saudi Arabian government for their role in the plot. This is the 12th veto by President Obama since his term began in 2008, but unless lawmakers are persuaded to drop support by next week, this will lead to the first congressional override during Mr. Obama's presidency. And with the first 2016 presidential debate just a few hours away, Donald Trump supporter Rudy Giuliani says his candidate is well prepared to take the stage tonight, though his tactics for getting ready were a little different than his opponents. And I think we'll also have two candidates who have totally different views of America. Everybody is concentrating on the personalities, and I'm concentrating on the issues. I mean, one is pro-growth, the other is pro-dependency. One is for a strong America, the other is for a much weaker military. One faces radical Islamic terrorism, Donald Trump, and she doesn't. She talks around it, about it. One has a history of tremendous success in business, including this wonderful building that I passed through many parades as mayor, and the other has been the most unsuccessful Secretary of State in the history of America. On the other side, Hillary Clinton is favored in tonight's debate, but she didn't take preparation lightly. Mimicking the 90-minute debate, Clinton spent the last three nights preparing with her aides and advisors at a hotel a few miles from her New York home. Clinton placed importance on defeating Trump rather than campaigning over the last four days, telling friends and supporters that her biggest concern is not knowing whether Donald Trump will show up moderate and controlled or blunt and combative. In just a few short hours, America will find out who took the right approach tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Unusually large amounts of phenytoin have been reaching Canada over the last four months. Border officials have seized, seized packages 32 times at various ports of entry across the country from May until last Friday. 8.46 kilograms worth of phenytoin have been seized, which is enough to produce more than 8.4 million pills and a potential street profit of nearly 169 million Canadian dollars or 130 million American dollars. Many of these packages containing the deadly synthetic opioid were postmarked from China. U.S. Senators are now urging the Obama administration to adopt stricter standards on packages from abroad that are being transported into the U.S. by private carriers. Poor work habits and other issues at the Department of Veterans Affairs are causing more than one-third of calls to a suicide hotline to go unanswered. Some of the hotline workers are handling less than five calls a day and leaving before the end of their shifts, despite the steep increase in crisis calls over recent years. An average of 35 to 40 percent of crisis calls that were received in May rolled over to senator centers with workers who lacked adequate training to deal with the problems presented by the veterans. The House of Representatives has proposed a solution through a bill requiring the VA to ensure communications in a timely manner by an appropriate person. It seemed like temperatures were feeling more like fall earlier this morning, but what can we expect for our weekly temperatures? Christine Williamson has that answer when Stormwatch returns.
Oxford. I hope you're enjoying this cool weather as much as I am. It was so nice to have a change from game day weekends. Very warm weather. This beautiful 81 degrees that we've had today. It was even cooler this morning with some very breezy winds, partial clouds, and it's not too humid outside. It's feeling really lovely for the end of September. Now, as we take a look at our radar, we can see we've got a little bit of rain in the area, not too much coming into North Mississippi. There's going to be some clouds, uh, but we shouldn't expect any rain for the next week. Now, moving on to regular temperatures, Oxford's definitely the warmest in North Mississippi right now. South Haven at 72, Holly Springs at 73, Corinth at 79, and Oxford and Tupelo definitely staying the warmest at 81 and 85. Now, taking a look at tomorrow's temperatures, it's going to get even cooler, and I know you're as excited as I am about that. South Haven will be 78 degrees, Holly Springs at 77, Corinth at 79, Oxford at 75 degrees, and Tupelo at 82. Now, as we take a look at tonight's temperatures, it's going to be very cool. So I know we're all very pumped to finally feel like it's fall for the end of September. At 70 degrees, we're going to have a little bit of clouds, some wind still coming in from the north, northeast, a lot like this morning, and not too much uh, humidity in the area. Tomorrow, as you head about your Tuesday classes, it'll be sunny and 75 with clear skies and no clouds. We're still going to have some breezy winds and no chance of rain. And thankfully, this is going to carry over into our five-day forecast and into the Memphis game this weekend. It's going to be some really beautiful weather. We don't have any rain in the sky, but we do have a little bit of clouds on Friday and Saturday. Doesn't look like we have any chance of rain, but it looks like the Memphis game is going to be beautiful and hopefully not as warm as Georgia. Well, I'm so glad to hear that because these last two weekends have been almost miserable. I know. I was sweating both game day weekends. It's ridiculous. I know. Well, at least with the night game, we know it'll be a little bit cooler. I know. Maybe we'll actually have some fall by October. There you go. We can look forward to it. We'll wait. Well, coming up, huge news out of Baton Rouge regarding LSU. Hugh Freeze looks ahead to Memphis and two major losses in the sports world. Sports Watch reporter Colin Rivera will break down all the things sports after the break. Welcome to Sports Watch. I'm Colin Rivera. From celebration to heartache, after a loss to Auburn Saturday night, Les Miles was fired by LSU. Miles was 114 and 34 during his 12th season and even won a national championship in 2007. Unfortunately, since 2013, he was 15 and 11 against SEC opponents. LSU, who's 2 and 2 on the season, the main problem was a consistent quarterback. The offense is ranked 119th in passing offense and with only 148 yards per game. At Origin will be the interim head coach for the remainder of the season as LSU is pursue, pursuing current head coach Chimbo Fisher and current Houston head coach Tom Herman. Back in Oxford, Hugh Freeze and the Ole Miss Rebels are looking for continued success after beating Georgia big. Here's what Hugh Freeze and Chad Kelly had to say about their upcoming matchup against Memphis this weekend. They're a very confident football team that has won a lot of games in the last few years. Justin did a great job there and now Mike uh, has his obviously carrying it on. They put up some crazy numbers uh, offensively and defensively. They're playing very, very good football. So it's going to be a great test for us. I'm excited to have uh, the first night game in our stadium. I expect it to be a uh, take it up a different level from our fans. We need them desperately to make it difficult for opponents to play here, particularly on a Saturday night. And uh, I guess I'm challenging our people to, to make it a very difficult atmosphere Saturday night uh, when Memphis comes here. Um, anytime we play against Memphis, it's a little rivalry um, that goes back a long, long time ago. So uh, it's big for our, us players. It's big for this university. And um, just go, going back to last year, I mean, we had a good lead um, to start the game off, but we kind of let off the gas pedal a little bit. So we just got to make sure we keep on um, rolling with this offense and keep going fast. Sad news in both the baseball and golfing world as Jose Fernandez and Arnold Palmer passed away on Sunday. Fernandez was involved in a deadly boating accident early Sunday morning that ended up capsizing his boat. Local officials said he hit a patch of rocks that may have been hard to see with no lights. Fernandez was 24 years old and was the star pitcher for the Miami Marlins organization. The Marlins game on Sunday was postponed after hearing the news and they will wear the number 16 during tonight's game in honor of Fernandez. The Marlins will also 
uh, retire his number 16 as well. Arnold Palmer also passed away Sunday evening as he was 87 years old. Palmer was considered one of the greatest golfers of all time and was one of three golfers to ever win the Masters over four times. That's all we have for sports. Be sure to follow Newswatch on Twitter at Newswatch underscore UM to stay up to date on all things Ole Miss. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Colin. When we come back, find out about four rare additions to a polling zoo. White lions were born in a Polish private zoo yesterday. These cuddly friends are set to become a major attraction because they're believed to be less than 100 white lions left in the world. This addition to the zoo in Poland has expanded the global population of white lions to 15%. Well, now that we know about the lions, as we move in to play the tigers this weekend,